Richard Howarth with Square Books. Uh, welcome to today's event, a uh, conversation between Wright Thompson and John Grisham. Uh, quickly, I want to, while y'all are getting settled, announce a few upcoming events, uh, Square Books and Indie Publisher Source Books. On Wednesday, uh, day after tomorrow, we'll have an evening of conversation between three writers, among three writers, as they discuss their recent novels set in the South of the past and present, including Kelly Mustian, Natchez native, uh, for Girls in the Stilt House. And then on Tuesday, May the 4th, uh, you might keep this in mind for Mother's Day gift, uh, join local author, cook, and caterer, Elizabeth Haskell High School, as she presents a special cooking demonstration live from her kitchen in celebration of the release of her latest book. Um, ticket prices for this event are $46 for pickup, $56 to ship, only those with tickets like today's event uh, will be admitted, although anyone can buy signed books. Purchase tickets using the button above or scroll to the bottom of the page. $10 of every ticket goes to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Uh, one ticket holder will be selected to receive a chef dinner and demo for 20 guests in Oxford. That sounds good. Though not as good as today's bonus prize, a basketball signed by John Grisham, which I can palm because it's a, a junior sized basketball. And, uh, and, and quickly I'll introduce these two gentlemen who basically need no introduction. Uh, Wright Thompson is a writer with uh, ESPN and the uh, author of a book of his uh, collected pieces called The Cost of These Dreams. It's available in paperback. And most recently, uh, the book Pappy Land, which is a, uh, just a great nonfiction book, an account of this uh, Van Winkle family, four generations in Kentucky, but it's really about fatherhood and, uh, and, and Wright's got some personal insight in that too. And then of course, John Grisham, uh, you all know, he's the author of, by my count, I may be off, I think 44 books, uh, seven of which are Theodore Boone books, um, and a number uh, are uh, sports-related books, like today's book, Suli. Um, one thing these two writers have in common is while they nominally are writing about sports, or in John's case, usually a, a legal thriller, um, they always have a deeper, more meaningful sort of humanistic thread going through their through their books. And that's the case with Suli. Just a great, great read. Um, at the end of the event, I'm gonna have that drawing for the ball, but now I turn it over to Wright and John. Thank y'all. Hey, Richard, happy to be back. Hey, Wright. Thank you. Hey, John, uh, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for doing this. I sure uh, appreciate uh, being asked. It's interesting, I've written a lot of journalism about the a lot of the things in this book. And I guess I want to start there because uh, it all vibed really true to me both. I mean, I've written about Sudan and I've written a lot about college basketball. And uh, so the world building in the book I thought was really sophisticated and uh, dead on. And I'm curious, I mean, it's a sort of a two part thing, but what drew you to both of these worlds? The uh, Sudan and uh, the world of college basketball? There are two or three inspirations for the book. Uh, first of all, just a love of sports uh, that, that I have had my entire life. And um, one of the most memorable things that ever happened to me as a, as a kid it happened in Oxford uh, when I was 13 years old. LSU came to town with Pistol Pete Maravich. He was a sophomore. He was scoring uh, 40 points a game. And he was unbelievable. And uh, our coach somehow got tickets for the whole team. He couldn't buy a ticket. People were hanging from the rafters of uh, Tad Smith Coliseum. And we got in to watch the game. And it was mesmerizing watching Pistol Pete score 40 points with two men hanging all over him. And, uh, and Ole Miss won the game in overtime. Uh, it, was a, it was a great night. But from that point on, I was going to be, you know, Pistol Johnny. And my best friend, <laughs> Pistol Bubba and Pistol Billy and Pistol Tommy, we they had a had a huge impact on us as kids. And and we did nothing but play basketball. We we talked about quitting all of our other sports and just being you know concentrating on basketball. 
which is a good thing we did not do that. Uh, so that, that was an inspiration. Um, I love sports stories. I love sad sports stories. Um, two or three years ago, I read a magazine article uh, online about a team from the South Sudan playing in a showcase tournament here in the States in the summertime. And it was a great article. I forget who wrote it, but it was about uh, the kids from South Sudan. And they became the darlings of this tournament because of the way they played. They were just phenomenal athletes, jumped through the roof, uh, played with great enthusiasm, shot blockers, uh, just, uh, and they won the tournament easily. And also their coach uh, was trying to use basketball to um, teach them certain lessons that they could take back home to their country, which has been ravaged by war for 50 years. And they come from very humble uh, backgrounds, very poor country, very dangerous country. Uh, that was uh, an inspiration. Uh, we, got, we live here in Charlottesville now. We got all the UVA home games. And UVA had a kid, uh, Mamadi Diakite, who is uh, on an NBA roster right now, who came here from Ghana and uh, didn't play much his first couple of years and got better and better and uh, but played with this infectious smile, infectious enthusiasm, and he could block anybody's shot. And, and he got drafted last year, and he signed with the pro team. So we, we enjoyed watching him play. And a lot of the other African players who come over here, uh, they're just fun to watch. And so that, all those kind of came together to, to, to make the story work. And then a year ago, um, I was in a bar with some buddies uh, about to start doing our brackets, which is always a waste of time. Um, and, uh, and we, when we was on the TV that flashed March madness canceled and we were just stunned. We, we couldn't believe that nobody, you can't cancel March madness just like that. And, uh, it was very depressing for all of us. You, you, all, all the sports fans, that's our favorite sporting event is March madness. And uh, that was sort of the impetus to go ahead and wrap up the story, get it ready and start writing. And that's how it all came about. Is, uh, by the way, uh, do you have a legal themed name for your bracket or any of your fantasy sports teams? No, I, I stay away from fantasy. I'm not smart enough and I, I shouldn't be doing brackets. I have, I have not picked a final four team, I think in 20 years, I always try to pick the underdog and that never works either because this year, the number one and two seeds made it for the final game. So, you know, most people pick the top four number one seeds in the final four. It never works that way, uh, but you can't pick the Cinderella team. So I'm always trying that and I never did anyway. You know, one of the things that occurred to me uh, reading it was that in it, well, there are a couple of things that I want to get at, but one is I thought there was a really sophisticated understanding and description of uh, what it's like to be watched and what it's like to go from unknown to known and how, you, you know, you know, it's like the Heisenberg principle, like the act of watching something changes it. And I'm curious because you've had some of that in your own life. And I'm curious how your own experience of living to a certain degree in public informed your understanding of what would happen to Suli when he started playing basketball on television. I can't draw many parallels because the situations are so different. Uh, I dreamed of being, you know, the great, we all did as kids, a great, you know, sports figure and playing in front of big crowds and doing heroic things and I never got close, but it was a, a fun dream of, of a kid to have. Um, and, you know, with, with Suli, he, uh, he starts off very slow and becomes through hard work and uh, a lot of growth physically, he becomes this phenom. And what fascinated me about the story was I love these, this happens all the time where some player, uh, usually at the professional level, will come out of nowhere and just light up the world you know, for a short period of time and then fade away. And those, those are sad stories, but they're also fascinating stories. I did it with Calico Joe, my baseball novel. A kid comes out of nowhere and starts setting records and then, you know, something bad happens to him. So that's, that was more of the inspiration, I think, for the, for the book. Uh, I have no idea what it's like to, to be uh, a, a famous athlete uh, but I did talk to some uh, UVA basketball players who who know uh, some kids who are in the NBA and, you know, got a good dose of what their lives are like. And and uh, I've talked to professional baseball players before to, you know, to learn and to listen and to dream. And uh, uh, so that was part of the inspiration, too. Reading it, you know, there's 
I kept feeling like I was being asked to think about the system, you know, like the, the, you know, everything that is required of a college athlete who suddenly becomes this kind of public commodity and like, yeah. not to put you on the spot, but if I made you commissioner of the, or president of the NCAA, like what are things that you think they do that work and what are things that you think should be changed? Well, in basketball, I'd, I'd stop the one and done immediately. Uh, I would just stop that. Uh, if you want to turn pro out of high school like you can in baseball, go for it. Like LeBron did, Kobe. You know, we have a number of major stars who have done that because they were physically ready for it. Most kids are not physically ready for it at the age of 18. Uh, but if you sign with a college, you have to go for at least three years. Uh, that's That should be uh, – and I think coaches would love that too because coaches don't want to lose these star players. Uh, we have a new transfer rule right now, which is disastrous. You can transfer one time without sitting out a year. And uh, that just became the rule in college basketball. It was, I think, prompted by COVID, but still they, they have now passed the rule. You can transfer. So each college coach now has to not only recruit, which is brutal. Um, that's a different world. I didn't get into that much. But, but they have to re-recruit every year to make sure your players are going to come back. Because if you have a star hotshot freshman who doesn't play a whole lot, you may lose him. So that affects, you know, how you juggle your roster and who gets playing time. And these are all issues that, you know, we shouldn't be worried about. Uh, I, I would, if I were commission NCAA, I'd, I'd, I'd pay the kids some money. Uh, let them, let them, let them make some money playing basketball because everybody's making money off of them. Uh, it would take a lot of the sleaze out of the game. I think coaches are sure getting paid. The, you know, the fans don't mind. Uh, I'd, I'd let the players earn some money. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd make several changes. You know, I mean, and in the book, it, it is very clear that there's an entire, you know, from the meetings the coach has with the university president, I mean, it's pretty clear that everybody has their finger in the pie. <laughs> and I'm curious, I mean, <laughs> did, did, I mean, did you know all of this bef and this was just in you or was there some sort of like deep dive you did into this world to do this? Well, I, I didn't know a lot of it. I, I, I did some, I did what I normally do. I talked to people who know more than I do. That's how, that's my favorite form of research. Yeah. I talked to some college coaches, um, uh, coach at NC central where Suli ends up in college. I talked to him and he said more than once, he said, he said in college basketball, everybody has an angle. Everybody has an angle. The players, certainly the coaches, the universities, the, you know, everybody's got an angle and it's not always, you know, a good thing. Uh, but you've got coaches who are always ready to move to the bigger job. And you, you know, it's, it's play, players, agents, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a lot of balls in the air. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't really know all that. For example, I didn't know, um, I didn't know that an NBA agent, and they're, they're you know, a lot of good ones, uh, their earnings are capped at 4% of the contract price of the contract. Uh, they can get more for off-court endorsements and things like that, but uh, a, a good NBA agent or, or a bad one can only charge 4%. Uh, used to it was 10. So they've capped that. You know, just things I, I learned uh, along the way, talking to player, former players, talking to coaches. Um, and nowadays, right, as you know, my gosh, with, uh, with the internet, uh, the whole world is at your fingertips, especially when you're researching something. You, you know, a lot of the South Sudan stuff that I, that's in the book, the, the, the plight of the refugees and the horrors of the civil war and the atrocities. Um, I didn't go to South Sudan, don't plan to. Uh, the State Department doesn't want us to go there. It's the second most dangerous country right now in the world. You, you shouldn't go there. And I was not tempted and COVID, you know, really helped me out there. I was not tempted to go. But you can watch YouTube videos all night long and get a real flavor for what the horrors, the terrible situation there. There are a lot, I've read probably a dozen books about South Sudan, about its history, uh, its politics, the suffering, books written by refugees who survived and came to America. There's, a, there's just a wealth of, of uh, information that I, that's how I did my research. Yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting uh, because I, did, I was going to ask if you've been to South Sudan because it read like you had, which is the ultimate compliment. So uh, no. uh, I was I was like, why? Well, I, I don't know why you would go. You know, I'm not the, uh, no. Uh, is so? Did you write this? Did, were you writing this 
when the tournament should have been going on in 2020? No, a year ago, uh, in March of last year, I was, my writing schedule is I start a legal thriller in January and uh, finish it by around the 1st of July, six months. And so I was in the middle of, of a time for mercy, uh, which turned out to be a very, very long book. <laughs> Both of my books last year were too long because I had nothing else to do but write. I couldn't go anywhere. And so I was writing Time for Mercy, but I knew um, as soon as I finished that in July and August that I would jump into Suli. I wanted Suli to be a, a 50,000 word short sports book, like uh, Bleachers, Playing for Pizza and Calico Joe. Those are all about 50,000 words or short books, kind of books I love to read and the ones I prefer to write. I did not, and the book was twice that long when I finally finished with it. And I had to go back and, and do some cutting then. Uh, but I started, uh, you know, roughly August of last year. Is, I mean, as a sports fan, when, when I was reading the basketball games, one, it felt like I was watching a basketball game. And two, I just kept imagining you sitting at home smiling, you know, sorry, that was the ice machine behind me. I just imagined you sitting at home smiling, you know, it was sort of like, like you were watching games in your head. Uh, I, did you... This is an inside baseball question and I apologize, but like, did you sort of have the season mapped out in your head or did you let the team, or was that happening in real time? I mean, I like, had, uh, no, I, I, I sat down and did an entire basketball season schedule for North Carolina Central University. Their that's what I figured. Yeah. And uh, with scores, uh, I mean, that was tedious. Um, and, all, and then one challenge with the book is you start the basketball action in the summer league. There are eight games there. Then there are 30 season games, regular season. Then you get to March Madness, so you got five or six or seven more games. That's a lot of basketball, and you can't just go game after game after game. So, you know, I had to, I had to just touch on some of the action because, you know, that's, that's usually one of the challenges of, of writing – anything is to keep the action going and not bog the reader down with a lot of stuff you, they, they don't want to read. Uh, so I do that. I do that with legal thrillers when you have courtroom scenes, because uh, most courtroom dramas are pretty dull. It's not that exciting. And you, you're, you're writing about an entire trial that goes on for days and you've got to keep the action going. So I kind of learned with the, with the courtroom stuff, you've got to, you got to move it. You can't, you can't dwell on every game. And I didn't want to dwell on the games until Suli started playing. About halfway through the season, he finally comes off the bench, ditches the red shirt, and he's playing. So uh, that's that's always a challenge. There, there were times when I was writing uh, some of the more exciting games when I was I, I was really uh, almost too excited to write. There, there, there's a scene there's a scene in the in the book that I would love to see in real time, where in the in the span of 58 seconds. Uh, Suli hits five three-point shots to tie the game, late in the game. And um, wow. that's probably, I'm not sure it's ever been done, but i probably get close to that. Some, somebody did. Uh, but that was, uh, that was very exciting to write. And I caught myself thinking, well, if I'm this excited looking at you know, a blank screen and a typewriter or a keyboard, uh, maybe the reader feels the same excitement. So that, that was, that was uh, something I hadn't counted on, to be honest. I, I did not plan to to get so excited in some of these games. Well, I mean, sitting at, you know, reading it, I mean, I know the game you're talking about, obviously, and uh, I mean, it was interesting because part of me was like, well, they got to, like, you know, I got an inch and a half left. Like, they got to, but, it, you know, it, but it, the other part was like, there's no way you can do this. And so I was totally invested in, in, that, in that story. I mean, it was like, you got to stand up and sort of walk it off after he does it, you know, like, okay, that's great. Uh, it, it, one of the things, was there a model for the relationship between uh, Suli and the coach of the travel team? Uh, and, or, or did, or, like, I'm just curious, that was a really intimate relationship that felt real. And I'm curious, sort of, the evolution of that in your head until it landed on the page? Well, the magazine article I referenced earlier that was the initial inspiration for the story uh, was all about, well, it was about the kids. It was also about the coach. And the coach was um, actually a white guy from the U.S. who was coaching the, the South Sudanese team. 
and he was he, he loved the kids so much and he was determined to use basketball to teach them some lessons in life to help to help build their country because the, you know leadership is desperately needed at all levels of uh, South Sudanese society. And he, uh, for example, it was his idea, and I stole this for the novel, uh, that they would wear very simple uniforms, nothing flashy, nothing gaudy, uh, very simple, almost practice style uniforms without no names on the, the jerseys to reflect the, um, the poverty of where they come from. Uh, and and that, was an, that was a coach's idea, a re the real coach. And so I just took things like that and, and, and the relationship that a coach, I've been around enough coaches to, um, uh, to, to realize how much they love their players. I was in a coach's office one time, just, you know, having coffee and a player stuck his head in the door to ask the coach a question. And when the coach saw that kid, uh, the coach just forgot about me. It was all about the kid. He got up and he wanted to make sure the kid knew what he was doing and answered his question and, he was so he loved these he loved his players so much, and most of the coaches are like that. They just, uh, especially in basketball, they just they just they love their players. They want to protect them. They want them to do great things. So I got I got a, a taste of that watching that coach interact with his kids, and I've been around other. I've been in a couple of locker rooms with with uh, players and coaches, and so uh, you know all that adds to the adds to the mix. I certainly know what you're talking about, having seen how the way coaches feel about their players in private when, you know, basically no one is watching. Since a lot of people who were listening to us might not have ever done that, I wonder if you can describe from your perspective, I mean, I know they're bad apples, but generally how coaches, what coaches feel their responsibility is for and to these people who come into their programs? Well, they... You got to keep in well. We, this is obvious, okay? Uh, that coach's livelihood depends on those nineteen-year-old kids, and uh, so he's got to protect them, coach them, teach them, and watch them grow, and stay out of trouble, uh, which is always a challenge on any college campus. Anytime you have you know great athletes who are uh, uh, admired so by the student body, um, and so the co the coach has to really get involved. Some coaches uh, like Izzo at Michigan State, the, co the players become family. The, the players hang out at the coach's house. They, 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 they're in the backyard in the pool. They're, they're barbecuing. You know, they're, they're doing all these things. Uh, they, they're, they're like family. And uh, some coaches are known for that. Um, other coaches keep a little distance because, you know, you're going to have a lot of disgruntled players. There's always an issue of playing time. And the other coaches are not quite as warm. Uh, I can't imagine Bobby Knight, you know, <laughs> being uh, that warm and fuzzy with his players. I don't know. Maybe he was. I don't think so. I love John Feinstein's book, A Season on the Brink, that came out 30 years ago. And yeah. I was talking to John Feinstein last week and doing an interview, and he was talking about writing that book and spending so much time with Bobby Knight. Anyway, it's a lot of, I love that book. Uh, but the, the, every coach is different, but, but most of them, you know, by the time they get the kids here, and the great thing about basketball and these summer showcase tournaments, the one I write about, the coaches sometimes meet these kids when they're 15 years old and they, they see potential. They know they're going to grow and they start developing relationships with, with kids when they're very young. Didn't happen with Suley, but that's, you know, that was probably unusual. And if, if they're lucky enough to get the kid to sign and come to their campus and, and be in their program, uh, they wake up every day determined to protect those kids and make sure that they, they grow and do what's right. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, as you, you've seen it more than I have, it's a very intense bond between college basketball coaches and the players. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, one of the things I never forget is uh, I was standing next to Les Miles when uh, Honey Badger got arrested and I was listening to Les's side of the conversation with the Baton Rouge Police Department. And it was, what? He did what? No, no. And, it, and, and he hung up and I'm like, what was that? And he was like, I gotta go. But it, you, the, the love they feel is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, a guy named Charlie who said, you've written about football, baseball, and basketball. Uh, will, uh, will we ever see a hockey novel? One Mississippian ask another Mississippian. No. 
No, I don't. Do you know the rules? I don't. And I'm I work. Don't, I'm a professional sports writer. I don't know the rules. Uh, I, I have more on my plate trying to keep up with basketball, football, and baseball. I'm not going to watch soccer, or <laughs> hockey, or NASCAR, or you know. Again, I don't have time. I don't. I don't care about those sports. Uh, I'm just not going to go there, and especially hockey. I mean, I, I do not know the basic rules of hockey. My wife's parents live in South Haven, Mississippi, still. Uh, my in-laws, uh, great folks. And years ago, they started going to the Memphis River Kings hockey games because there was nothing else to do. And they <laughs> learned the rules. They went to, they had little seminars for fans to come in and learn the rules. My in-laws went, loved it, learned the rules. And they watch hockey now nonstop. They know all the players. They have favorite teams in, you know, Long Island, Minnesota, Ontario, wherever. They know uh, the, the players, the Russian players. I mean, it's, it's great. It gives them something to do. But again, I, I try to watch a game with them occasionally. And I, I still don't know the rules. That sounds like a description of a circle of hell. So your <laughs> in-laws love hockey. I'm just yeah. like, the, uh, yeah. uh, is, uh, what's your, what's the best basketball game you've ever been to? Like, what's the one where you're like, like, what's the, what, I don't know, what's your, what's the best one you've ever seen? It goes back to a game in Oxford in uh, in uh, the spring of 1968, uh, the winter, when Pistol Pete Maravich came to town as a sophomore. The LSU, he was, he was averaging 40 points a game, and every game he played in, in the SEC for three years, you couldn't find a ticket. I mean, it, it was just packed. You tell these funny stories about when he was a freshman, back when you, you couldn't play uh, varsity as a freshman, in freshman teams. And they, the freshman game was before the varsity game. And LSU, the Coliseum or whatever it was back then, would be packed, standing room packed only for the freshman game to watch Pistol Pete. When that game was over, everybody would leave. And the varsity game would come out and they'd play. You know, <laughs> and, uh, but it was, that type of, uh, it was that type of madness when Pistol Pete you know, took the floor. And we were there. We had tickets. Our coach got tickets for us from the South Haven Mustangs basketball team. And I was a 13 year old eighth grader and um, just not third, I'm sorry, 13 year old seventh grade. And uh, watching Pistol Pete play was, uh, was a experience I'll never forget. He scored 40 points that night uh, with two men hanging all over him. And they fouled him nonstop trying to, he, he shot, I don't know how many free throws that night, but it was just a, a, a magical experience I'll never forget. What? What did the place sound like with some with a player like that in it? Well, it was a road game for LSU, uh, so it was an Ole Miss crowd. Um, we were <laughs> – our coach was an Ole Miss guy. He got mad at us because we were pulling for Pistol Pete. And, uh, and Ole Miss won the game in overtime. It was a, it was a great game. Um, there were times when he would – the fans weren't cheering for him, uh, but there were times when he would make a shot – uh, and uh, the, the, everybody would just go almost, you know, just swoon in disbelief. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of racket. Ole Miss kept the game very tight, and that made it terribly exciting. So the crowd was roaring all night long. Uh, but it was – and then afterwards, we got to go down to the locker room, and we wanted – the coach wanted us to talk to the Ole Miss players who had just won the game in overtime. And we wanted to go see Pistol Pete. And there was a guy named Rich Hickman who played for LSU, who scored 30 points that night, by the way. And he came out and uh, we asked for his autograph and we said, where's Pistol Pete? And he said, well, he's taking a very long shower. We lost tonight. And so we never got to see Pistol Pete. What's the last autograph you got? The last autograph uh, I got. Um, oh, wow. Um, I've drawn a blank big time. I don't... Um, Probably um, Tony La Russa uh, is a buddy of mine. We were watching a Red Sox game when he worked in the front office there. And I got the autograph of, um, well, I can't even remember the player's name now. <laughs> he gave it to me. Yeah, that's, that's a, I've never been asked that question, so I, I can't answer it. I've got some baseballs. Hey, uh, I've got, uh, I've got um, the signed Ted Williams. I've got a signed uh, nope. Stan, Stan Musial. Stan Musial. I got one of those. So wow, got a few autographs. Yeah, yeah. Like that's like you know, I love the question. Like if your house caught on fire, what would you grab? I mean, the Stan Musial ball has to be in the conversation. 
I got. I'm in my office downtown uh, in Charlottesville now, so it's it's here. This place is basically fireproof. I'm on the sixth floor <laughs> of an office building. I, I'm not worried about fire, but uh, I would grab the uh, the Ted Williams. Actually, costs more than the Stan Musial, but they're both uh, they're both kind of pricey. My wife bought them for as birthday gifts years ago. So uh, I'm not much of a collector. That's I good. collect uh, I collect uh, uh, first editions. I uh, love to collect books, but not not baseballs. The uh, uh, I'm, this is an interesting question. Somebody wants to know if you listen to music while you're writing. No, I can't. Uh, it's just too distracting. I've tried many times. I've tried to listen to. Um, I mean, if it's somebody I really love, like Springsteen, there's no way to concentrate because you're singing along with the, you know, or trying to sing. I've tried jazz, uh, something softer, slower. Uh, that didn't work. I've tried classical once or twice and that really didn't work i love uh i love classical guitar i don't i don't know beans about it but i i'm fascinated by it i've tried that but no i've stopped trying i just can't concentrate uh i, I write in a in a small office behind the house on a farm about 10 miles from here and uh and i start at seven in the morning it, the office is uh quiet and dark there's no phones no fax no internet and no music and for three or four hours each morning, just like today, I get that time to myself. And that's what I, that's when I, where and when I write and how I write. And I, and I still look forward every morning. To those three or four hours. Is, uh, have you ever seen Springsteen? Uh, twice. I saw him in Memphis in 1984 wow. with the uh, 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 Born in the USA tour at the Mid South Coliseum. I saw him here in Charlottesville probably 10 years ago. He was touring, so yeah, twice. And I say, I, the best, I saw him on Broadway. Oh. He did um, did about a year's worth of work with his one-man show on Broadway. And then um, my wife bought me tickets for me and a couple of my buddies, law school buddies, to go to New York and watch Spring. We're all big Springsteen fans. And uh, that was absolute magic, watching him in a small crowd, a thousand people. Uh, talk and sing and all that. And, and, and he, he finally had to stop it because they realized that the ticket sales would go on forever. He has yeah. so many fans. They, and I, after, I think, two or 300 performances, he was probably burnt out doing it. Uh, but he, So he stopped it, but it could go on, on forever. You know, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things he talked about in that show was sort of the difference between being an ancestor and a ghost uh, for your own kids. And it, it was, you know, interesting reading Suli thinking about the ways in which so many of the characters invest so much of themselves in giving a better life to someone else. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm curious if that was, if that just emerged through the, the, the journey the characters went on, yeah. or if that kind of thing was in your head when you started. No, it was not in my head when I started. That's the great thing about writing it. As you know, you, you start with one idea and you have you have a good idea. I do. I have a very solid idea about where the story is going, because I don't. I have a rule. I don't write the first scene until I know the last scene. And once you have the last scene, uh, it's pretty hard to get lost. And so I, I don't get lost. But the, the one of the gratifying parts of writing is is what the book becomes and the surprises, the things you don't anticipate, the things you can't plan, the things you can't outline. The characters who suddenly show up out of nowhere and take over a scene or take over a subplot. And that's that's something that still is uh, a marvel to me is how is how you can't plan everything in a story, a short story or a long story. And so with Suli, I, I was not I, I was I was intrigued by um, the kid. And I, I knew I wanted the reader to to fall in love with the kid. And um, because I did very quickly in the yeah. story, I really fell for this kid. And um, by the way, the title, it's a terrible title. We, I tried every cliche, every, everything I could think of with basketball, you know, above the rim, beyond the arc, in the pay, whatever, all the, all the, all the sayings we have with basketball. We, we worked on titles for almost, almost, you know, six months trying to get a, the right title. Suli was the, always the working title. His name is uh, Samuel Suleiman. Suleiman's a common name in East Africa. 
and that's where I, I'd seen the name before. So that's, I stuck that name on him and, and then Suli became, you know, his nickname and Suli became the title of the book. So it was not going to be Suli. It was going to be something else, something far yeah. more clever. I loved it. And I mean, it's when the, because the, the, the crowd chanting his name yeah. felt like a real evocation of some of like the essential thing of the book, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Rick Olashak, John, wants to know, uh, what is your go-to shot in a game of horse? He also says, go Gators, but we're going to try to pretend like he didn't say that. You know, I have not played a game of horse um, since I quit basketball in, uh, I was a junior in high school. I got through my junior season at South Haven High School. We won one and lost 24. It was not a fun year. <laughs> And I just didn't want to go back my senior year. The whole team was coming back. So can you imagine our senior year with the same team? Uh, and I just didn't want to go through that. So I quit basketball when I was 16 years old. And and I played so much of it. And I had so many big dreams. And none of that worked out, like like most kids. And I kind of got away from the game. I didn't, I didn't want to pick up a basketball. And uh, a few years went by. I finished college. And um, we, li <laughs> we lived... I married Renee Jones, who lived almost next door to us in South Haven. Uh, she and my younger, youngest brother went to high school together. She's six years younger. And so I never had noticed her when she was growing up. When I came home from college from Mississippi State in 1977, she had grown up while I was away. And she had a, a basketball goal in her backyard. She was all conference basketball player in high school, loved basketball. And she was out there all the time shooting uh, buckets. And so I eased over there one day and um, we started, you know, shooting, we started playing horse and I never beat her in a single game of horse. I, I couldn't even hit a layup by the end. So uh, I, I, if I, my go-to shot is probably a layup. I can make it. Well, I, I would argue that your go-to shot in a game of horse is securing uh, Mrs. Grisham, but uh, <laughs> you know what? Uh, there were there were a lot of guys hanging around. <laughs> there were a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of guys hanging around, and I you know, I got the girl. Oh, hail to the victor! The uh, uh, someone wants to know uh, who you go for when Ole Miss plays Mississippi State in baseball and football. Now we're getting to the hard stuff. I'm a state fan. I went to Mississippi State. I graduated in 1977. Ron Polk uh, came there when I was a junior in 1976. And uh, the program was in bad shape and Polk, uh, you know, energized uh, that program and he changed the SEC. Uh, by the time Polk left uh, state, uh, you know, every, almost everybody had a new stadium. Uh, the game was much bigger than uh, between Ron Polk and Skip Bertman at LSU. The game was transformed and look at it today. It's still great today. Um, I'm one of the few state fans though that pulls for Ole Miss. They're not playing each other because I had three wonderful years at both schools. And uh, I have great memories of, the law, of my three years in Oxford. Uh, we, moved, we moved back to Oxford in 1990 after practicing law for 10 years. And, and I was about to become a full-time writer. We moved back to Oxford in, in 1990 and uh, loved the town, loved the people, loved the bookstore. Uh, and this is, I think, our, uh, our last thing and a fitting place to end. You said at the beginning, uh, and I didn't know this, but, you know, you like sad sports stories. And I do, too. I think a lot of people do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm curious, uh, why do you think that is? Like, wh what is the universal thing running through sad sports stories that seem to always resonate? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, this is, a, I guess, it should be a spoiler alert, uh, but I, I, won't give, I won't give away the ending of the book, but uh, in the early 1980s, uh, when Michael Jordan was rampaging at UNC, he had a rival who was just as good at Maryland named Lenny Bias. And Lenny Bias was, was his equal, and he was a great – they were both great. And uh, I've watched Lenny Bias play on television, you know, several times. Um, and Lenny Bias was the first-round draft pick of the Boston Celtics – in uh, 83 or 84, I can't remember the year. And uh, he was on top of the world. And two days um, after he was drafted, he died of an overdose. And he was not a drug user. He was not, he was a good, he was a good guy. He just got with some people one night and didn't know what he was taking. And so people have always, people especially around here who saw Lenny Bias play in the ACC, um, always talk about what, what could have been. 
what could have been. And the, the, the lost potential, the lost greatness, the loss of a wonderful young man and a wonderful career he was about to have. That's why they're so sad because you take someone who's at the pinnacle of life, at, you know, very, very young and, and you take that away from them. And it's extremely sad because we all, so many of us wanted that life. So many of us dreamed of that type of glory and to see somebody get it and then suddenly it's gone is, is, uh, is very sad. John, I appreciate your time. I know all the folks at Square Books do as well and uh, really appreciate the book. Uh, it, it's really great. I think people are going to go nuts for it. Uh, uh, I mean, you can't stop reading it. And uh, thank you so much uh, for the conversation. It's uh, very appreciated and always nice when you come home, uh, even if virtually. <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Great seeing you again. Let's get together sometime. Yes, sir. Take it easy, man. Caitlin, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to both you guys for, uh, for doing that today. Really, totally fascinating. I meant to mention on the, on the front end that uh, the Square Books' two best-selling books last year were written by these two writers. And I won't say which one is one and which one is two. They are very close to each other. So thank y'all for that. And thank y'all for this today too. And Caitlin, I'm going to leave it to you. Sure. Here we go. And John, if you need to scoot, we of course understand. Okay. I'm going to buzz off and go to Jackson. All right. Give them our love. Thank you. you. Take care. All right. That's our winner. William, we'll get that basketball to you um, shortly. All right, y'all. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I uh, hope you enjoy Suli as much as we do. Okay, take care. <laughs>